like about both Black male and Dartmouth is there still is a minimum academic qualification. So we have a calculation using test scores and GPAs and all this kind of stuff to help a coach understand if this student will be competitive or not. But what we do then is if a coach is presenting somebody to us, we can do that calculation and then we can say, red light, yellow light, green light. Red light is, after looking at this transcript, these test scores, we don't care how good the student is, we will not admit them to our institution. They're just not academically competitive enough. We do not think they'll be successful. Then you look at yellow light, which is, we think, we think there's some good stuff here, but maybe recommend that they take the SAT or ACT again. Or maybe it's, you know, they're doing well in school, but their rigor curriculum isn't quite there yet. So maybe you can encourage them to maybe take another upper level class to help them round out um, their academic schedule. And then green light is, they're awesome, we love them, keep recruiting them, we'd love to have them on our campus. So that is a piece about athletics that could come into play for your student. Uh, or it could be things like, how much do they love maybe the outdoors? A fun fact about my career, I worked at the two institutions at the oldest and second oldest outing club in the entire country. Um, St. Lawrence is the second oldest, Dartmouth is the oldest. If that is something your student is inter interested in, be looking at those places. Look at those places that have great matches and fit for your student that they can pursue the things that they like after graduation. Maybe it's service work. You know, if you're thinking about service work, are you looking at institutions that is in their mission statement that all of their students are going to be dedicated to community, whether it's local, nationwide, global. Are those things that your student's going to want to be able to pursue and, and participate in when they get to the institution? Um, another big one that comes up around social life is Greek life. Um, and that's something that, again, I've had vastly different experiences with. St. Lawrence, very small. Um, I think there's maybe one or two fraternities, maybe at most. Sororities, there's a couple more. I think there might be three or four. Um, and I should preface this by saying I'm speaking from the lens of when I was there from 2009 to 13, so things could have changed. Um, but Dartmouth and Bucknell, we both had, uh, we have um, very active Greek life. Uh, both very similar in that students can't participate the first year, but out of that sophomore through, through senior class, both of our institutions have over 50% participation rate in Greek life. And, and what I always say about Greek life is, where's your student's comfort level? Are they okay going to an institution where there is a lot of Greek life and that's fine even if they don't want to participate? Or is that a turnoff where it's maybe I don't really want to be around a Greek scene at all and I should be looking at institutions that don't have it at all or maybe it's not as prevalent? Um, what is the Greek scene at that institution? Are they comfortable seeing it? That's one of the things I always try to be really transparent and honest about when I work at institutions like Bucknell is that you're going to see it. People wear their letters, um, our men have houses, our women have a residence hall dedicated to them. It's going to be present. If that's something you don't want, then you probably shouldn't be looking at an institution like mine. And then you get into things like the arts. I think the arts are another kind of big bucket area where a lot of students ask us questions about um, their, their ability to participate in the arts. And again, I think the right questions to be asking are things like, how can you participate? Is it open audition for everybody regardless of major? Or are you looking at an institution where they're going to say, you need to minor or major to be able to be in a theater production or to be in our dance company or to be in one of our instrumental um, or singing groups? Those are realities of different institutions. And I think that's something else. If, if, if your student wants to do those things, how are they going to be able to pursue them at the schools that you ultimately end up looking at? And then uh, you know, the last big piece um, is the financial fit. You know, as, as you all go on this journey uh, together, I'm a big proponent of you, um, if you're comfortable, being really honest with your student about what, what are you willing and not willing to do. Um, because one of the hardest things that we see in our field is a student who loves our institution gets in, the money isn't where they want it to be, and the student really is blindsided by that. That they're thinking that, you know, everybody's supporting them, go wherever you want, and then suddenly it's like, well, not anywhere you want because this one isn't gonna work out. I think it's an easier conversation if there are some limits saying, go for this institution, but know our limit, and if this doesn't come through, it's probably not gonna be an option for you moving forward, and that's okay. And I think some families are very good about that. You know, I have students right now that after we admitted them at the end of March and April, they were just saying, you know, my family and I talked to them, this really isn't financially feasible, is there anything else that can happen? You know, they know. They know going into this process as a student that that's going to be reality for them. And when we think about financial, but again, as you look at institutions, we all have different financial models. And, it, and, it, and somehow I keep ending up at both ends of the entire spectrum of colleges and universities. Um, so when I look at a place like St. Lawrence, they're need aware, which means that they have a budget to keep. 
they can't spend more than that or else it puts them in some pretty bad financial situations with their budget. Uh, and they give a lot of merit money on top of their need based aid. Um, so if you're somebody who, maybe your family, you know you're not gonna qualify for need based aid, but you're saying, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we could just get a merit scholarship to help us knock down the price a little bit? A place like St. Lawrence is giving away a lot of merit money. I think at this point, 98% of their students receive some form of financial aid, whether it's need based or merit based aid. So that's an institution that's really going after students, um, giving some nice awards to students who maybe don't have financial need, but they're trying to attract more academic talent with merit-based scholarships. Uh, at Bucknell, we're kind of, again, in the middle. So I'm at an institution we are need aware. This year my budget was $16.85 million on first-year students. I try really hard not to go over that, um, again, because that money has to come from somewhere. We are an institution that doesn't have much merit at all. So we have a couple scholarships here and there. Um, it's not a huge part of our budget. The majority of our money is going to need-based financial aid. Uh, so we're, at, we're in a position where only 60% of our students receive some form of financial aid, whether it's need or, or merit-based. And then you get to Dartmouth, which honestly is, is probably almost the gold standard of, of colleges and universities with what they can do. They're need blind, meaning they don't really have a budget um, for financial aid. They can admit who they really, really want um, and aid them accordingly. And they also meet 100% of demonstrated financial need. So that means when families fill out paperwork like the CSS profile and the FAFSA, if it says a family can only give 10,000, Dartmouth will give them like the 60,000 that's left over to make it affordable. Um, you know, that's, that's one of the other pieces is about meeting need. Bucknell and St. Lawrence are places that don't. We don't quite meet the full need. We don't have the ability to do that right now. Um, so for us, we're gonna be asking maybe a little bit more than a place like Dartmouth. But again, those are the nuances of all the different places that you could be looking at and how, how you wanna go. I should also mention that Dartmouth is a place that doesn't do merit. That's actually an Ivy League policy. They only do need-based financial aid um, at those institutions. So merit is not gonna be an option. If you're not gonna qualify for aid, you're, you're not gonna get anything except a loan um, if, if you want it. So we think about those pieces, academic fit. Um, we think about social fit. We think about um, financial fit. And then we try to match it with our process. So as we think about what is your student presenting? What are the things that they wanna pursue academically? Socially, um, for some of us that have financial aid budgets, we do think about that financial fit because again, we have to make sure we're not going to over award or overspend our budget. And then we try to make a match ourselves. So if your student is indicating that they feel a match and then we're trying to find the right match. I will say, I feel like the most difficult thing in our field is that our decisions honestly usually don't make sense to the outside world. They make sense to us because of the things that we're looking for and that we need. Um, so when I think about you know, the three institutions I've worked for, a simple one like geography, let's take that for instance. Dartmouth, not really worried about it. They have a global brand that's really well known. They're gonna go to all over the world and recruit students. But in their eyes, they're not really saying, hey, you know what, this area of the country, we really need to build it up because they're, they're pretty much already there. At places like St. Lawrence and Bucknell, we're still highly dependent on our traditional regions of the Northeast. You know, for me, 80% of Bucknell students come from DC to Boston, that whole like Northeast corridor. Right now in, in our profession, we know that area of the country is losing high school graduates because of migration patterns. People are going south and they're going west. So our, our heavy traditional market is shrinking, which means it's gonna be more competitive. So in our mind, you know, for me right now at Bucknell, part of it is we need to make sure we're still being really good to our, our traditional area. We need to be really honing in on places like Maryland and Pennsylvania and New York and New Jersey. We need to keep solidifying in those places. But we also, as an institution, need to be looking at new places to go because it's just not sustainable. So we're looking at can we get more students from places like Charlotte and Atlanta and Florida and Texas and California? That takes work. So I'm balancing these two priorities right now of how do I maintain our good relationships in our backyard, but how do I also start admitting more students from other parts of the country and the globe to make sure that I'm stabilizing our enrollment, stabilizing our application pool. So those are priorities that we have. So I, frankly, I'll be really honest with you. If I see a student who is a little bit more on the border and they're from a place outside the Northeast, I'm probably gonna tip them in. Because I'm like, if we can get them, it might help start a, tra start a, a, a trajectory with that school or that community that we can get more and more students from that area. But at the same time, like I said, I'm also trying to be really good to our, our home markets because I still really, really want them and need them. So it's that balance back and forth of what are we going to do. We think about things like 
diversifying college campuses, and diversity is a big and heavy word, and it can mean a lot of things. So we think about diversity can be geographic, it can be religious diversity, it can be students of color, um, it can be international diversity, uh, a, a big hot topic in our field right now is socioeconomic. How do we make sure that we're getting a good spread of socioeconomic uh, strata in, in our college campuses? I think our biggest fear is that we'll barbell a class. We'll get students who don't need money and can pay for, for our institutions, and then the students who get really, really good aid are saying, I can afford that because I'm getting a really, really good financial aid package. I think a lot of us are afraid of losing more of that middle ground because the pinch is on those families who have really solid incomes, probably nationally are in the upper middle class, but I call them um, higher education middle class because they're definitely a lot more wealthy than the, the median uh, salary in the United States, but in, in colleges, they're not. Those are the families that are not qualifying for aid and they're like, how am I gonna pay for this when it's gonna take 50 to 60% of my take, take home pay? That's not, that's not real. So we're trying to do more, I think, to make sure there's better socioeconomic diversity too. So that comes into play as we start crafting our classes. Um, and then it depends what's happening in our institutions. So again, I mentioned that with the academic fit um, at my institutions, there's open enrollment at places like Dartmouth and St. Lawrence. Bucknell's more structured. So one of the pressures I have as an enrollment manager at Bucknell is I'm given seats per college. So when I look at this incoming class, my targets were 200 engineers, 160 students in our College of Management, and then uh, 620 in the College of Arts and Sciences, which was further broken down into 210 for the Natural Sciences and Mathematics and 410 in Arts, Humanities, Social Sciences, and then students who were undecided in the Arts and Sciences. So for me, I'm also looking at crafting a class based on what the institution is telling me to do and what, where they have seats, where they have capacity. So that's the other thing that can be tricky about fit and match and how our decisions roll out is that sometimes it honestly has nothing to do with your student and everything to do with how the application pool shook out and what we're looking to do to fill our areas. Should I stop? I'm looking, it's like 15 <laughs> minutes until the end. Mm -hmm. um, Can we do through Q&A? Yeah, we'll do Q&A. Um, Anything I missed? Um, no, I think you dropped some okay. incredibly transparent information on that. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and I will just say, again, with the financial fit piece, I think one of your best friends can be the net price calculator on college's websites. Um, the, the federal government mandates that all of us who have federal funding have to have one, uh, so that can give you a good estimate. I will honestly tell you, I think the most difficult part of this process is actually financial aid. Um, and part of that is because of how institutions run their programs. So if you're interested in that scholarship opportunity, you gotta pay close attention to each school because some of them will say, our application deadline is January 15th, but this scholarship you wanna apply for, the deadline is December 1st. Mm -hmm. So there are all these nuances that you've gotta keep really good track. Or, you know, I'll be honest, one of the things I don't like about Bucknell right now, mm -hmm. our merit scholarships break into three categories, which is there are two that students can apply for at time of application. There are some that we just give out so your student doesn't do anything, they just apply to Bucknell, we can give it to them. And there's another set that what we do is we read the applicant pool and then invite students to apply partway through the process. It's confusing, so I'll get out, <laughs> and I'm trying to change it. But that's, that's the crazy thing about financial aid, how it can all work, is just every school can have their own extra deadlines or extra nuances. Um, so that's another piece of advice I have, which is just try your best to, to look at those things and keep on top of them. Yes? Uh, the net price calculator. Oh, sorry. Oh, gosh, gone. yeah. That's I'm okay. Going. No, we haven't, we haven't gone there yet, but they can absolutely use that tool now. Yeah, so the net price calculator. Some, uh, essentially what you do, I would recommend that if you're going to do net price calculator, you sit down with your uh, most recent tax returns and all your financial information. Essentially what it does is it's going to ask you a lot of questions about your finances, and each school has developed it so that it's supposed to give you an estimate of what you might receive in financial aid from that institution. Um, again, I think... So there, I, I always say two things, which is one, the estimate is only as good as the information it's put in, <laughs> so be as accurate as possible. And then the second thing is that for schools that give merit aid, that's not always going to show up. So like with ours, we don't even ask questions and estimate merit. We are only doing need-based calculations. So again, it's, it's not perfect. It can give you a ballpark, and I think that can be useful um, as you think about financial fit. I wouldn't necessarily cross somebody off the list right away, um, just because in a price calculator, you probably want to do a little more research, talk to your college counselors with what they know, but can at least give you 
a starting a starting line. Yeah. So maybe some questions just yeah. in general about fit and match, and as you're kind of embarking on this journey with ninth and tenth graders. Yes. So if you had a child who truly has no idea at this point, would you say we're in a big school or a small school? So I try to think about what's your best bang for your buck. So the, honestly, one of the first pieces of advice I have if you're not sure where to start is to try to go somewhere local. Even if your student has no, int maybe it won't even be a, a place your student will end up going. But thinking about, um, you know, can you go to like University of Maryland for a day or can you go to somewhere like Goucher? Just to get that sense of walk on the campus, hear what the admissions office is saying, or go on the tour. I mean, maybe not even if they're if they're young, if they're ninth and tenth, maybe don't even do the information session. Just maybe go on the campus tour and walk around and see what the students are saying. Um, see what the interaction is like because it can at least give you a direction. So if you go to um, a big school and you walk around, the first thing you can do is size. How do you feel? How do you feel about campus this big? How do you feel about the number of students that are walking around and and, and how that feels? Um, because it at least can start pointing, right? If they like it, it's like, okay, so maybe we should be looking at some more mid-sized and big schools. But if it's a, that feels uncomfortable, I used to a place like Garrison Forest that's smaller, more intimate, you know, it can at least lead you in that direction to start going there. Um, and to hear about the student experience, because maybe something will resonate and say, you know, I liked when the tour guide said this, and that, that connected with me, but I really didn't like this. Um, and that can help, again, your college counselors are great, they go to all these breakfasts, they come visit us, they have some good insider knowledge of kind of what are good matches and fits for your student. Um, but I'll echo what Anne-Marie said, which is nothing's going to be perfect. I think there's this notion of perfection that it's gonna be the absolute perfect fit. <coughs> and there's always gonna be something that isn't perfect at each institution. But I think just starting close by to get a sense of urban, rural, big, small, mid-sized, um, hearing about the curriculum. That's something else I, I didn't really mention with the academic session se section is what type of curriculum is your student interested in? True liberal arts where they get to explore? I think about a place like Brown that has a completely open curriculum where you can kind of do whatever you want. And then I think about a place like Columbia that's very, very strict. Like everybody's taking the same classes for those core requirements. So that's something else to be thinking about when we visit is what's that academic experience like and do students enjoy what they're doing? Um, or, or just hearing about it, does your student enjoy what they're hearing about that? Does that help a little mm -hmm. bit? Okay. Thank you. Kevin, can I just also talk yes, and please. talk about so absolutely what Kevin said, um, what he said, and um, in the junior year, so now like before they get to decision making, um, they can go, you can take them to local college campuses, right? Go to, we have Goucher, we have McDaniel, we have Hopkins, we have Loyola, Maryland. Um, we have uh, University of Maryland College Park. If you wanna go a little bit further down the road, we've got Georgetown, we've got GW, we've got American. I mean, you know, we've got, you know, 25 institutions within uh, an hour radius of us, right? So, um, you know, take advantage of our geographic location and maybe pop onto some campuses and see, um, you know, just to get them to start to see what a college campus looks like. Um, a lot of college campuses look like Garrison, right? I mean, this looks like a college, a small college campus. Uh, oftentimes when they come and visit us, when the reps, um, admissions folks come and visit us in the fall, most of them are like, oh my gosh, your campus is so beautiful. I'm like, thank you. Uh, we feel so lucky. And um, and then like, wow, how do they choose a college yeah. if this is their a high school, right? Um, you know, because it's not a one building place that has three stories that looks like it was, you know, built. It looks like a jail. Um, that's not the way we do business here. So um, that's where I went to high school. Um, so you know, so that is. I mean, just to see the differences, right? But then when you start getting on the campuses, you're going to see even, um, you know, Georgetown, American, and GW are all what I would consider urban campuses in DC. But when you visit them, they're all distinctly different um, feels of their campuses. So I would say now you could do that. Um, but rest assured that in decision making, that's very much a part of the intentional um, college counseling practice that we do with them. We have crafted a series of surveys um, where we um, force them to reflect on their experience here. We force them to reflect on their classroom experience. 
um, in a in a way that you know it doesn't seem forced. But you know, um, do you uh, do you prefer tests or papers and projects? Like, how do you like to be assessed, right? Because if you're going to the University of Maryland as a freshman, you're going to take a lot of tests. Do you do well on tests, or are you more of a project paper kind of person? You know, because then maybe you know, because if you're in a uh, a 300 seat lecture at a large flagship, you're not going to be doing you know projects, and the professor is not going to be grading a bunch of projects in a 300 seat lecture. You're going to be taking a Scantron test. So we talk to them about that. We tease out because it's really hard when someone says like, "Do you like big or small?" And they're like, "I don't know." That's and that's a relative term, right? Do you like urban or rural? I don't know, right? So the, we do we do these like Jedi mind tricks to like get this information out of them. So um, so we're gonna get there. But for now, take them around, see if you can't assist. So thank you for the transparency around things like. This one's really high on merit. This one's not so much there on merit. This one has a lot of group life. This one has a. How do we find that out about other schools? Websites. Websites can be great. Um, so I think as the college list is developing, as your student gets older, <coughs> doing some research because a lot of it is there. Um, mm -hmm. It's sometimes I'll be honest. Sometimes it's not the easiest to find, yeah. but you can get it. I would also say. Um, Again, I think the College Counseling Office, a lot of times because of their connections with the reps and knowing the institutions, um, they have some sense of, of how that will shake out. Um, and I also think there's some search tools out there that you can plug in some metrics and it can spit out a list of schools that might fit for your student. Yeah. Um, what he said, and. <laughs> um, and we do, uh, in college counseling class, um, our students uh, do have a s uh, software that we use. There are search engines in that um, that they can put in, start putting in their preferences, and then out pops a list, and then we workshop that list together with them. Um, uh, so that's how we start. We teach them, actually, how to do that research, right? Um, because we don't just want to pop them, you know, come into our office, this is what I want. Okay, here's your list. Here's list A, here's list B, here's list C. We want to teach them how to do that research on their own because then we're, mm -hmm. we're not just giving them, you know, fish, we're teaching them how to fish. So, um, so we do teach them how to do that kind of um, very discerning uh, research that's important, how to use the college websites, not just go to the admissions tab, but um, go to the academics yeah. tab, go to the uh, student life tab, you know, see what kinds of uh, organizations, student orgs are on campus, um, you know, see what division athletics they are. I mean, all of that comes into play. We use um, nationally reported data. We show them how to use some um, government federal data um, to see numbers of females and males, um, self-reported data on, um, on race and ethnicity, um, admit rates. So we, we teach them how to use these tools in our, uh, in our class. Are we still using Naviance? That is a great question. Um, currently, yes, and we will be switching uh, this coming year. So uh, for our um, for our current uh, our current seniors have Naviance, our current juniors have Naviance. We will be switching to. We actually are running two systems right now. We have a system called Score that we've been running concurrently with Naviance for the last two years. It's fabulous. Um, has a great search tool. That's what we use for college search. It's awesome. Has some great um, data. Are they called infographics or something? I don't know. Whatever. Um, Dashboardy looking things. Um, but we're also going to be introducing a new tool that's called Maya Learning. So um, that might be something that you've heard at other schools. But Maya is a second generation Naviance. So we're super excited to be introducing Maya uh, to the se uh, rising senior class. And then that's what your students will be using as well. So first of all, thank you. Uh, very educational. Mm -hmm. So through the junior year, um, as you spend time with the girls and, and you get to learn a little more about them and their history and where they want to go, you know, it seems like going back to something you started with, there's a lot of talk and a lot of chatter about she wants to go to Georgetown or she wants to go to Harvard or she wants to go to Yale. And, and I feel like the name of the school is more of the influencer rather than where they want to go in life. So do you help them with that through the junior and senior year, maybe steer them a little closer to what will work best for them and like thinking about 
later in life after college, you know, where do you want to be? And this is maybe a, the, the list of schools that you should share with your parents that mm -hmm. fits best for you. Uh, do you do any of that or? Yes, um, thank you for asking the question. Yeah. Uh, very much so. So often when we talk to uh, ninth graders, if we talk to ninth graders, but also when we talk to sophomores, uh, if they tell us, well, I already have a list of schools where I, I know I'm going to apply or I want to apply, and I'll say, okay, tell me your list, right? And inevitably, it, it is um, so part of that list are some of those schools that are in the top 1% that you know we all know the names um, because that's what they hear. That's what they hear, that's what they see on TV, right? Those are who play in the bowl games. Um, that's what we read on all of the headlines. You know, Stanford's admit rate was 4%. That means they denied 96% of their applicant pool folks, right? I mean, really, that's what a 4% admit rate means. 96% of the kids that applied did not get in. Um, but they hear these terms, right? Um, you, you know, you guys may have gone to um, Chapel Hill or UVA um, as an undergrad, or Vanderbilt as an undergrad. Those are very, very different places today than they were 20, 30 years ago, right? Um, they look very different. The makeup of the school is different. Their admit rate is different. And um, but sometimes, you know, I went to Allegheny College in Meadville, Pennsylvania. Um, another. Yeah. Another Buckeye <laughs> up here. Um, and Meadville is not, you know, Washington, D.C. It is not a thriving metropolis. Many people that I tell here that I went to Allegheny College, they're like, where? Um, uh, but, you know, it, it, it changed my life. It changed my life. It was a great fit for me at the time. But I will admit to, a bu to buying an Allegheny Gator onesie from Olivia, my daughter, when she was born. She wore an Allegheny Gator onesie, right? The Gators aren't really, it's not like she's, you know, it's not like we're Villanova or UNC Chapel Hill or UVA, but she had a onesie. I would imagine many of you have given your children onesies or maybe a t-shirt from your alma mater or a sweatshirt from your alma mater, have worn your parents' sweatshirt. So they basically maybe have grown up thinking that they're gonna be a Tar Hill since they were like this big. Um, and maybe the Tar Hill, the UNC, they're, they're not meant to go to UNC Chapel Hill. But you know, we all have these sort of like subliminal messages that we, that we give to our kids. So we're fighting that, right? Yeah. Um, there's a great book um, that uh, who, Where You Go Is Not Who You Will Be. Um, I highly recommend that. Uh, also, another one of our catchphrases is we want to help a student find um, find the school that fits for her, not try and fit into a school, right? We want the student to find a school that fits her, not try and fit yourself into a school. And you guys have, may have a little more success in <laughs> fearing them than possibly. You mean they don't time. listen to you, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> you're not listening to all that sage not advice that you're giving yeah. her? <laughs> right. We hear that a lot. Actually, it's fascinating. They, they kind of do listen to us. So um, not all the time. Not all the time. But um, we do find that, yes, they're, they're receptive. They're open. Um, yeah, they get there. Yes, Brian. Uh, so there's a lot of information out there. maybe to avoid or things to avoid. Um, my number one front and center, please, 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 please don't go there is College Confidential, okay? College Confidential is not um, run by professional admissions colleagues, okay? It is not run by professional college counseling colleagues. It's run by students and parents. Um, so there is a lot of misinformation on College Confidential. That is, that is definitely my number one. When the kids, when the girls come into our office and they're, but, but I heard Mrs. Strauss that, you know, uh, you know, that Bucknell is releasing tonight and I heard it on College Confidential. And it's like February, we're like, no, we're not. Where'd you hear that? College Confidential, College Confidential. You know, a lot of misinformation. So we very much dislike College Confidential and we would very much like to ban it 
block it from your internets. <laughs> block that college confidential thing from your internets. It's, it's bad news. Um, the other thing, very honestly, that, um, that I would say I would not use heavily, if at all, is US News and World Report, okay? US News and World Report rankings are not what you should be using to choose a college. Um, I feel very strongly about that. Uh, and um, we do not use them in our offices or in our practice. Do you have anything? Those are the two. Okay. <laughs> it's pretty much, I mean, these are the two things amongst the college counseling and college admissions community. College Confidential and U.S. News and World Report rankings are both um, the evil empire. question was, um, for the schools that are going test optional, they truly not, not care about the test score. Um, so St. Lawrence is test optional, so I always say I grew up in a test optional environment. Um, and this February, Bucknell announced that we'll be test optional for five years as a pilot um, to see what we can do and study our students and for hopefully, I, I'm hoping to keep it. Um, so in my experience, the truth is if a student says they don't want their scores, it, it's honestly fine. We are not we are not automatically assuming that, oh, they must be bad scores because they didn't send them. We don't do that. I always say that our job as admission officers is to evaluate the information we receive. We cannot create the narrative that's not there. So if there is a story we wanna hear that's not in the file, if there are test scores that aren't there that we would like to see, we can't assume because it's not in front of us. So in my experience, yes, if a school is test optional, uh, they truly are saying we do not need a test score, we are going to um, evaluate the student without it because so much of our decision making is based on so many other pieces and I'm not going to lie to you a test score is important but it isn't the be all end all I think there's so so much there's such a bigger story to tell um, that if it's not there you just move on and, and use the rest of the file I will say if, if a student is looking at a test optional institution and they don't submit scores there's going to be more emphasis put on the high school transcript and how they performed and the rigor of curriculum because that that's that's then the academic piece that we're looking at, and then the recommendations see how they're interacting with the class environment. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. How does that, how does that relate to then from an officer's career? How do you decide whether it's okay to ask or to ask or to mm -hmm. And what is looked upon from the admission standpoint as ethics or yeah. not different at all? So I can, yeah. I can touch the piece about how do we look at an ACT versus an SAT. Um, how do I want to say this? I don't care is the best way I can say it. It, it, does, it doesn't matter to me which one they submit because, um, you know, we after the new SAT happened, there was a bit of a boon in ACT because students knew they could probably study for that one a little bit better since it wasn't a brand new test. So I think, you know, we're still, each in, it, institutions depend on what they're going to be more heavy with, SAT or ACT for their submitters. Um, but we honestly don't have a preference. I think it's a, uh, maybe Henry could see more of this about fit for a test done because they are they are different in how they're set up. Right. But from our end, it's either or. It doesn't, it, we're not gonna say one is better than the other. Yeah. I don't know if you wanna talk about how to choose. No, not at all. Um, I mean, it is a fit thing and that's why, because they are different tests um, and they, uh, like I said, are paced differently, they test different things. Um, that's one of the reasons why we are giving them practice with both of those tests, so that they will hopefully, you know, by the time they're a junior, they will um, have a preference one way or the other. Sometimes they'll take both, though, in their junior year, um, and then they'll say, like, then they will, you know, preference at that point, or, um, but yeah, usually that's what happens. So, but colleges uh, regard both tests equally if they're, if they're going to be, what the opposite of test optional is, is test conscious. So that's what we say if that's a very test conscious school. So, you know, um, Kevin, your testing, do you think your testing uh, is a good um, is a good sample or example of what you how you know you know learn and, and what you know? If he says, Yes, I love my testing, that's a 
exactly where I know because I have really high testing, <laughs> right? Then, you know, we're going to say, well, then you can, you know, maybe you want to apply to those test conscious schools. But if he says to me, no, Mrs. Strauss, um, I'm not a great test taker. I feel like my academic performance over four years of high school is a far better indicator of how successful I might be in college. And my SAT and ACT scores don't really measure up to where I'm performing in the classroom. And I'm going to say, let's talk about some test optional places because let's not show them your testing because that doesn't really indicate anything at all. is how do we weight the different pieces of an application? Um, at the three institutions I've worked at, I would say all three have in common that the transcript is the most important. I think it's, at the end of the day, we're educational institutions. We want to make sure students can be successful in the classroom. So, and a transcript is going to give us a lot of information in terms of course selection over time. So what kind of curriculum has a student taken, how rigorous, and performance based on the school. So at the places I've worked at, we've always also looked at how the school grades. We have not we don't do the recalculated GPA type of thing because we're just saying, how does this school grade their students? We're gonna look at that. After that, I would say everything has pretty equal weighting. Um, so I wouldn't say that after the transcript, you know, oh, then it's X, Y, and Z piece in that order has the most weight. It's really about what are we seeing academically in the transcript? If, if there's test scores, how do the test scores kind of match up to the academic profile? Um, and then you get, and then the rest of it is pretty qualitative. I mean. The only other thing that can kind of be quantified is the is the engagement section, that the resume section, because students will tell us how often they do something, how many weeks per year, how many hours. So it's quantified a little bit, but there's also a bit of a story there with how a student's involved and everything else is written narratives by counselors and teachers. It's the essay. Um, some schools have supplements. They all matter. I, one of my lines is that I always say, um, uh, we, if, if we didn't ask for, like, we ask for what's important. If we, if we were going to consider it, we wouldn't ask for it. So that's, the, that's my whole philosophy is that if we're asking for a piece of information, it means we want it and we want to evaluate it or fold it into the review process. If we didn't think it mattered, we would just eliminate it. So I see the hand in the back, yes. Last question. is about AP classes, how do we look at them kind of in the context of the school and the student and all of that. Um, so, on, I mean, it, we look at it in, in the context of, of a student's choices, um, what they're pursuing, did they, did they take on a challenging curriculum. I, I'll be honest, I think at the three schools I've worked for, I think there are different expectations um, in terms of when you're admitting students, how rigorous of a curriculum does it need to be, what do they need to be taking. Um, I will say at Bucknell, because of how we, we admit by college, we are a little more sensitive to if they're taking honors or AP or, or whatever the school's offering, IB, all those lovely upper level classes. We do look for a bit more of a match. So for example, I had um, a young woman that we admitted early decision, and in March she emailed me asking if she could switch her major from creative writing to engineering. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm always happy to look. Um, and I look at this young woman's transcript, and all of her AP classes were in history, English, humanities and social science. She had taken no AP or honors in math or science, and I said, I'm really sorry, we can't do it, because that just, that match wasn't there, and we knew that with our type of curriculum in engineering, that would have been a bad move. Um, so I think for us, we do pay a bit of attention to what and where, um, but I, th I think at each institution it's gonna be different. I don't have a secret number I'm looking for either. I think for me, it's, um, if there's an opportunity for some challenge, did they take some? Not all, but is there some rigor there? Because we know what type of institution we are. We want students to be prepared. Um, but I think at a place like Garrison Force, we know that the education is very strong. Um, so I think we can be confident in students that are prepared for a place like Bucknell. And I will just say, as an endnote, because I sat through the presentation with you, just so you all know, as families, I've done a lot of these talks before. This is the most comprehensive four-year college counseling plan I've seen in 10 years of work. So, <laughs> I was very impressed with how much your students get to do in four years. So it's, yeah. it's really, really good. Yeah. I didn't even ask him to say that. So <laughs> thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to
to thank Kevin so much because um, you have just heard an incredibly transparent Dean of Admissions. Incredibly transparent. Thank you. <laughs> um, down to the numbers of seats in each individual major. I mean, that is, thank you so much, Kevin, because that is. Um, I mean, yeah, they all do that. <laughs> um, but no, that you've just you've just really been you've pulled the curtain back um, a great deal for our friends and our um, families this evening, and I and I cannot thank you enough. So can we give Kevin Mathis another round of applause? Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming this evening. I hope that your students will tell you good things, or maybe they won't tell you anything at all, which is likely to happen. Um, it's, it was fine, Dad. Let's just go home. Right? They're tired. So um, thank you for coming, and um, we'll see you soon. Yeah. <laughs>